cooperate with him. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. We have been discussing the pathway to significance. The pathway to significance. And I started out by saying that we live in a country where people will rather be prominent than be significant. We live in a country where everybody wants to be known. Nobody no, no, put pictures on newspapers, especially birthday greetings and all that, like Nigerians. In fact, people who run media houses in Nigeria, they make a lot of money from our excessive show of prominence. <laughs> we, we, want to, we want to publicize everything. We want people to see everything. We just want to show that uh, we are, you know, we are part of whatever is happening. That's what Nigerians love. But we are stepping to a time where God wants us to play, you know, to uh, put a higher premium on significance than prominence. It's good to be prominent, but what's the use of prominence when there's no signi- significance? I also said that meaning is more important than money. So you can wish to be rich, but what is the meaning? Uh, Jesus said, what shall it profit a man? If he gains the old world and loses his soul, what, what, what shall he profit a man? What shall he profit a woman? Because what the only thing that will go with us to the other side is what we, we have done with our lives that, that will count for the kingdom of God. Is somebody still with me today? That's the only thing. For instance, the Bible says, lay up your treasure where there's no moth or rot to, to, to corrupt. And I was taught when I got the understanding that the only thing that will leave this place for the other side are human beings. So if my treasure is not in human beings, then when we get to that place, there will be nothing to show for it. I want to get to heaven and have people around me who are saying, oh, you blessed me. The story of the rich man and Lazarus also gave us a very good understanding, a preview of what will be happening in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, the people that you bless or not will recognize you in heaven. They will recognize you in heaven. But you are not going to carry the money in your bank account to heaven. Somebody stay with me today. No, 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 you are not. But let that money bless somebody. That person, if the person is in heaven, then the person will recognize you in heaven. And by implication, heaven will rejoice over you. I said heaven will rejoice over you. So we said meaning is more important than money. And that God wants to use us. And then last Sunday, I discussed with us on the fact that God wants to use our shape. Can, can, you, can you project? Lati, can you give me my, my slide on shape again? That God wants to use your shape. He wants you to use your shape to be a blessing. And I said that people have different shapes. Like we have all these different shapes. As human beings, we also have different shapes. And in Isaiah 43, verse 21, the Bible says, The people I have shaped for myself will broadcast my praise. He shaped you for himself. He shaped you for himself. So you may, you may, and when we talk about shape, it's not only about how you look. You may be, you know, like me, like letter one. Or you may, you may be better endowed, you know, and I don't want to go into it. But <laughs> what, what, what I mean is that it's beyond physical shape. It's beyond physical shape. Can you throw the acronym for me, for shape? At switch... One of the Wednesdays in this month, I've discussed your gift. You can get the CD and listen to it. Uh, that's at a midweek event. Two Sundays ago, we, I spoke extensively about Moses and his passion and his heart. And the fact that a passionless life is a low life. You must be passionate about something. Your heart is the seat of your passion. And God wants you to use your passion for the glory of God. Of his name. That's the pathway to significance. There's no significant person on the face of the earth who is passionless. 
who they will have to beg to wake up in the morning. There must be something running through your veins, apart from your blood, that will wake you up in the middle of the night to pray or to study or to do something differently. And last Sunday, we discussed abilities, the different abilities that God has given us, that are peculiar to us. And I said, you have something. There's something. Talking about Moses, for instance, that God told Moses when he was sending him to, to, to the king's palace, to Pharaoh's palace, he said, you have a rod in your hand, drop it. And then he said, put your hand on your bosom, bring it out. It became white with leprosy. These are signs. These are the things that God has given him. And then God said again, if they won't listen to you because of these two things, then call for water from the river Nile. Pour it on the road and it will turn to blood. It will show them that I'm the one who is sending you. And then after all that, Moses still looked up to God that, you know, I cannot speak. <laughs> Exodus chapter 4, I think verse 10. He said, you know, I cannot speak. And God said, I gave you three things and you're focusing on what you don't have. I'm hungry. <laughs> have you read that in your Bible before? God said, I'm, 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 now I'm hungry with you. He said, look at your brother, Aaron. He can speak. He will be your mouthpiece. And I was saying that by inference, it may be that Moses was just envying Aaron. Seeing what Aaron had that he did not have. Instead of focusing on what he has. And we also discussed about his personality. And today, I want to talk about the last letter of the word shape. E, which stands for experience. Experiences. Or different experiences. There are many books from which you can also even read about your shape. One of them is Purpose Driven Life. I encourage that you read through and you know, do more study on your own, on your shape. Your experiences, and I've titled this, Don't Waste Your Pain. Don't Waste Your Pain. Don't Waste Your Pain. Join me in your Bibles. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Don't waste your pain. Please let me tell your neighbor, say, don't waste your pain. 2 Corinthians 4, I'll read from verse 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians 4, I'll read from verse 7 to 10. Tell another neighbor, say, don't waste your pain. 2 Corinthians 4, I'll read from verse 7 to 10. He said, but we have this treasure in having vessel, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are at press on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. I read another scripture. From the same Second Corinthians, now I read from verse 1, and I'd love to read verse 3 to 6. Second Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 3 to 6. And I want to read this from the New Living Translation. Earlier on, read from the New King James Version, but I'd love to read from the New Living Translation. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. If you don't have that translation, just still project the New King, I mean New King James. That's okay. All right. I read, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father, the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more. God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For for when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word this morning that will speak life to this congregation. This morning, we stand against pain, we stand against discomfort, and we ask that 
by your spirit. There's transformation in this gathering this morning. We thank you. Thank you because this word will bring a new beginning into somebody's life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Paul said that the God of all grace, the God of all peace, the God, the merciful God, is the one who comforts us in every situation so that we can also be able to comfort you when you go through whatever you go through. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something that God wants to do with every of your life experiences. There's something that he wants to do. There's something that he wants to do. Part of your shape is is what you have gone through in life. There are no two individuals who have gone through exactly the same things in life. Not even, you know, sets of twins. People don't go through the same thing. You know, to my utmost amazement, I read, I think in the early hours of this morning, about the fact that today happens to be the birthday of the world's oldest uh, conjoined twins. Um, can, can, I have, can I have their picture? Can I have their picture? Uh, today happened to be their 50th birthday, September 18. Today is their 50th birthday. These folks have been, <laughs> they've been living, George and Lori Scapel, been living for the last 50 years. 30% of their uh, um, brain um, veins and all that, and the part of their, sh- uh, uh, their forehead, have been fused together from birth. So it, it has become impossible for them to be separated. And that's why they are being like this. Uh, these, these, these two uh, um, people actually represent, uh, 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 against all odds, you know, using what you have and just, just living your life and being an example. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love, to, I love to read something about them. Remarkably, the twins are able to live very different and separate lives. With Lori having had a relationship, and George having had relationships, and George, who was born uh, um, Dory, but later changed, uh, changed her name to Reba, deciding to live like a man. According to, according to the son, that's a newspaper, the, the one online. While Laurie, who is five feet, one inch, was born able-bodied, four foot, four inch George suffers from spinal bifida, which has caused severe mobility problem. As George cannot walk, he sits in a wheelchair, wheelchair types two, which Laurie pushes, so the, the two can move together. The twins from Pennsylvania were born sharing 30% of their frontal lobe, uh, lobe brain tissue, and critical blood vessels, meaning they cannot be separated. Although the pair are both single, Lori has dated men. <laughs> Throughout the 1990s, George had a successful music career as a singer and won an LA Music Award for Best New Country Artist. The famous pair have been the subject of television documentaries, appeared on talk shows, and even made uh, a cameo, uh, cameo appearance on TV drama series, Nip Talk. Uh, uh, the big question for me this morning is how many experiences can be worse than this. Can you, can you display that picture again? How many experiences that you have had or that I have had can be worse than this kind of experience? And these folks have been living for the last 50 years, not only living an ordinary life, but living a life with some measure of significance. Is somebody still with me today? Uh, as in, when I was reading this earlier on today, I, I, <laughs> I was asking myself, so how did Lori uh, date men? Because two of them have to be together all the time anyway. 
That tells me that even though they're joined together, they're not having the same experience. No two people in life have the same experience. Our experiences are as peculiar as our fingerprints. And it's because God wants to do something with the experiences that we have. God wants to use those experiences to touch somebody. Paul said, with the same comfort that we have received, we want to comfort you. The same comfort that we have received, we want to comfort you with the same comfort. He said, we are persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. Message translation says, knocked down, but not broken. How many people have been knocked down, but yet you are not broken? It's to the glory of God. And God wants to use that experience, your knocked down experience, to bring up someone who has been knocked down, so that they will also not be broken. Am I speaking to somebody here this morning? I said, am I speaking to somebody here this morning? On the path to significance, there are regrettable, and resentful experiences. But God wants us to keep growing through them. You can fail forward. No failure is fatal. It's just an experience. There's no failure that you cannot recover from. It's just an experience. One of, one of my most overwhelming experience of no fatal failure happened to be a friend of mine. A friend, a lady friend of mine who had two kids out of wedlock by whatever stroke of chance or mistake and all that. This was someone that I, I, I mean, I, 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 I've been privileged to be a part of her life since college days, since university days. A Christian. But some things went wrong. And that happened. But as I speak to you today, she's married as a pastor. A mess has become a message. Maybe one of these days she will come here to, to speak to us. Because I'm not talking about uh, something that happened in the day of Jesus. I'm talking about now. I'm not talking about Bible character. Today character. She was in my office several weeks ago sharing testimonies about what is happening in our ministry. She actually pastors a church in this city. Just because she has refused to be knocked down and broken by the experience that she had gone through. These folks, also, George and Lori, they have refused to be knocked down. And thank God for parents who refuse to kill them. Parents who refuse to kill them. I, I was in the U.S. a few years ago, attending a conference, and there was this guy that was brought to the conference. His name is Phillips. This guy was born blind and lame in his two feet. And his father had the option of either just dropping him or killing him or, you know, just to move on with his life. But as God will have it, this man got saved and decided that God's glory will shine through this boy. This is is this, I mean, it was telling us that I, I took this as a life experience that God wants to use to bless other people. You know what he did? He insisted that Philip was going to go to school and learn like any other kid. But this was one thing that would make that happen. For them to admit Philip at the school for people with special needs, they, they also needed someone to always be with him. So his father decided to take a job at the graveyard, to dig graves overnight. Come home at 6 a.m. and take Philip to school and stay with Philip at school. As at 2007, when I met them at the conference in Chicago, Philip was on his way to college. He's been admitted at the University of Louisiana. <laughs> Philip, at that conference, ministered to us in music. Philip had gotten like two awards. His fingers were not equal. Very, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, um, some, I mean, disabled, you know, somehow. But if you see those hands on the keyboard, you will be amazed. 
Just because there's a father who said, I'm not going to kill this boy. I'm not going to throw him away. He may not look like a human being, but I'm not going to throw him away. As in, you take, they, they took Philip everywhere on the wheelchair. But that boy, if that, those hands, you know, just, just put those hands on the keyboard, you will get reading. The father recorded Philip at age four playing the piano at home and how shocked and amazed he was. He said Philip had never been taught how to play. He only listened. He had been listening. And one day, he rolled himself to the front of the the piano and he started playing and the man was crying and he recorded him. They showed that video that day. There's no life experience that is supposed to be wasted. No life experience that's supposed to be wasted. God had something in mind that he wanted to do. I was taught, for instance, um, uh, one of us here, I'm even saying this without his permission, I wanted to take permission earlier today. One of us here had a child with a, a, with a, a, a cleft palate. And my wife and I went to the hospital to visit the child after the first operation. And when we got there, we met a couple. They were carrying their own baby. Their own baby, I mean, much older. They, have, they, 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 they used to be colleagues. And so they, they heard somehow that they had a child with cleft palate. And they stayed with them. The day we went to meet them at the hospital, they also came to visit. They took them through everything that they had gone through. When you see their child now, you, you, you almost not notice that he, he had had any operation for the cleft palate. But they stayed with this one of our leaders in this church, and stayed with them, put them through everything, comforted them, spoke to them about what they went through, the doctors that they saw, and how the cleft palate had been corrected. And the day we went to meet them at the hospital, we still met this couple with them. Yet they were still giving them notes. This is what you do. This is, this is you know, there's no experience of life that is wasted. We have different kinds of experiences in life. Family experiences. Let me go through a few. Family experiences. When, 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 when I, if I go back to my principal character for this series, Moses, you will see the diverse experiences that God gave Moses as a person. One, Moses was born without a father figure. The only father figure he knew was Pharaoh, who perhaps he could not even, you know, uh, uh, say, I mean, stand in front of Pharaoh. Moses had funny experiences growing up. If you, if you, if you talk about um, educational experience, for instance, he, he had a good education at the king's palace. That was for a purpose. Because there's a, there's a measure of intellect, of intellectual capacity that will be necessary for his calling. There's no life experience that is wasted. Anything that you go through, God wants to do something with them. Family experiences. What, what, how did you grow up? Were you abused? Growing up in any way? Raped? Battered? There's something that God wants to do through every experience. Don't waste your pain. That's what I'm saying this morning. It may have been painful, but God wants to turn that pain into ministry. He wants to use that pain to touch somebody's life. Paul said, when we receive comfort, in our affliction. We want to comfort you with the same comfort that you have received. That's ministry. Comfort somebody else with the same comfort that you have received. People have vocational experiences. Different job placements. Different places that you have worked. The ones you enjoy, the ones you do not enjoy. Moses had different vocational experiences. He went to work, for instance, with Jethro. And from Jethro, God positioned him with Jethro just to learn leadership. Just to learn leadership. His father-in-law, Jethro, the man taught him delegation, for instance. It's a principle. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a universal principle of management. Because Moses was going to manage millions of people in the wilderness. And God prepared him ahead of time. I, I, mean, I mean, to have such vocational experience. I tell people today, if you have a, a, a boss who is a tormentor, it's for your good. Some people will never grow except there's an enemy that's tormenting them. That's the truth. But much more than that, somebody is going to have that experience one day. How best 
I mean, who, who is the best person to talk to that person about managing a tormentor boss? Apart from you. Who have been tormented, struck down, but not broken? <laughs> is that what you say with me today? Yeah. Let me nod your neighbor again and say, don't waste your pain. Spiritual experiences. What were your most meaningful triumphs and struggles with God? Have you been delivered from something? Have you been delivered from, from, from a habit? Have you been delivered from, from somebody chasing you in your dream? It's a spiritual experience. Has God used you somehow before? God wants that to be a ministry. God wants that to be something that you will, you will use to help somebody else to grow and to advance in life. Ministry experiences. How ah, have you served God in the past? If you have ever served God in the past, there's something, there's a reason why God took you to that. So for some of us, yeah, the last time you served God was probably when you were on campus. And you did something for God. God has a reason for taking you through that experience. Because he still wants to use that experience to be a blessing to somebody else. The last kind of experience that I want to talk about is perhaps the most important one today. Those are painful experiences. Painful experiences. Because I'm saying don't waste your pain. What troubles, hurts, turns, and trials have you learned from? Painful experiences. God never wastes a hurt. Whenever anything hurts your heart, there's something God wants to do with it. God doesn't like to waste a heart. Who is hurting you? Your spouse? Your parent? Your friend? Who? Don't allow the heart to waste. God will take you through it. It's just a going through. Go through to grow through. That's what God is always saying. I want you to go through so that you can grow through. But much more than that, there's someone that will need a share of that experience very soon. Very soon. Very soon. Very soon. Very soon. There's, there's, no, there's no better person, for instance, to minister to... to, to, to there's, no, there, there's, no, there's, there's no better person to minister to someone who has just lost a job than someone who has experienced loss of job before. A traumatic one. The only way you can say, I know what you are going through, is that you have been there and truly there. And you have refused to waste that pain. But to make it a source of comfort for somebody. Who can minister best to an alcoholic rather than someone who has been able to deal with the demon of alcoholism? Am I speaking to somebody here today? Because when somebody said, I, I, I just finished the 12th bottle, you tell them, I used to do 20. But here I am today. God has delivered me. Who else can minister better to a single parent than someone who has gone through the experience and now has good kids to show for it, has a good family to show for it? If any of us will be trying to do so, then we will just maybe be sharing from the Bible, which is not bad. Uh, but, but, but the real thing, the real issues of the experience is only if you have gone through it. But you can use it to minister. Who else can minister to somebody who is going through delay? Either delay of the fruit of the womb, delay maybe in marriage or whatever. Delay in getting a job than someone who has truly been through that. If you have never known what it, what, what it looks like to wait for a child for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, you will not be able to speak to somebody who has been waiting for a child. But if you have gone through that pain and God has seen you through, God said don't waste your pain. Turn it to love and lavish it on somebody. Somebody say with me today. Yeah, I turn it to love and just lavish it on somebody. And I believe at Elevation Church at this time, God wants us to do ministry. 
The path of significance is a path of service. It's a path of ministry. You cannot live a significant life until you, are turn, you, you begin to turn your experiences, especially your painful experiences, to ministry opportunities. And my assignment this morning is to mobilize this congregation to begin to see ministry opportunities from our painful experiences. I'll be very glad if after today somebody will say, any time there's anyone in this church that has, that's going through delay, please, this is my number. I want to be able to minister to them. If I, if I have two or three of them together, and we can have you know, time out together and share. That, that, that will be my joy. That, that's ministry. I'm trusting God for a time where we will have hundreds of such ministries in this church. It's not, it's not just about um, um, putting titles on people. No. It's about touching people's lives. Church is about people. For those of us who were able to make it to the workers' meeting yesterday, that was what I spoke on, hammering on. Church is about people. Church is not about the pastor. It's not about a building. It's not about anything but the people. People. And we can have such, some loose structures with which people can do ministry. Their own way. I just want a situation where somebody will be able to say, look, I, I, I used to be very bad with cigarettes. I used to be very bad with, 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 with booze. <laughs> and I, I just... If, if you have anybody struggling, we can have somewhat alcoholic anonymous in church. We, we just meet somewhere, or we just, can just meet in church. Maybe once a month. And I just, I just share my experience, and we just pray together. I just share my experience, and we just pray together. I want a situation where somebody will say, look, uh, let's, let's, let's put it on the projector. This is my email and my number. I'm starting a ministry to single Modest. Starting a ministry to single mothers. I'm, I'm, I'm starting a, uh, a ministry to parents taking care of disabled children. Parents with children with Down syndrome. I want to just reach out to them. And it goes beyond our church. I love, I love to use that money to put that in the newspaper. I say, if you have children with Down syndrome, there's somebody who wants to take care of them. Bring them to Elevation Church. Because that's your ministry to the world. <laughs> Praise God. That's your ministry to the world. It's beyond the four walls of the Elevation Church. This is a church without walls. We want to put that on our website. Let people see it. I want to be a part of the ministry that God is using you to back. Because you can back a ministry from your pain. From your pain. From your pain. Very important. Very, very important. Very important. Let me ask your neighbor, what will you do with what you have been through? Come and ask somebody this morning, what will you do with what you have been through? Time to turn your mess into a message time to turn your mess into a message. The only thing that is standing, that always will stand between you and your ministry, especially that which God wants to do with the experiences that you have had in life most of the time will be your inability to uncover them. The very experience that you have been, you have resented or regretted most in life the ones you have wanted to hide and forget are the experiences God wants to use to help others. Let me read that one more time for the sake of emphasis. The very experiences that you have resented and regretted most in life, the ones you have wanted to hide and forget are the experiences God wants to use to help others. If you're a lady here and you have ever aborted a child, it's an experience that you want to forget. It's, 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 it's a regrettable experience. But you see, Moses did worse. He killed a grown-up, not, not fetus. 
and yet God used him. God used him. The same experience he was running away from. He murdered someone. An Egyptian. So that an Israelite can be released. That was why he murdered the Egyptian. And then he ran away. Running away from that experience. Running as far as possible. Not wanting to remember that he's not had life from somebody. When God will come back in 40 years, God said, that same experience is your ministry. It's your ministry. Now you're not going to be killing Egyptians. I'm going to be the one to kill them. <laughs> All you just need to do is just go and tell them, let my people go. If they refuse, then I snuff life, life out of them. How somebody is following me today? Yeah. So there's nothing to be resentful about. There's nothing so regrettable that God cannot turn to a ministry. Nothing so regrettable that God cannot turn to a ministry. I don't, I don't know how regrettable that experience may be. You may have had a bad fight with your father. Very bad. Maybe your father cursed you. It's time to turn that experience around. Mend the situation with your father. But come up and say, look, if there's anyone who has an issue with father or mother, I've experienced it. I've come out of it. I want to help you. I want God to use me to be a blessing to you. I want from my pain, I want to laugh lavish love on you and get you not to experience the same pain but pleasure. Is somebody still with me today? I said, is somebody still with me today? At Vision Church, I wanted to be alive to God this morning. God is touching our hearts to turn our pain to ministry opportunities. Let me not your neighbor one more time. Don't waste your pain. God wants to turn your pain into ministry opportunity. He wants to turn your pain into ministry opportunity. So be willing to share them. Stop covering them up. You must honestly admit your faults, failures, and fears. People are always encouraged when we share our God's grace. Help us in our weaknesses than when we brag about our strengths. Ministry is not about your strength. Ministry is about your weakness. I am more encouraged when you tell me I used to be a bad liar. Jesus took light out of my tongue. Sanctified his tongue and made it a righteous tongue. That when you tell me I've never told a lie in my life, it stinks. doesn't look good. <laughs> You're trying to put much macho. That's not ministry. God wants to turn your pain into gain. Now, I believe I'm looking at people today who are willing to sign up for ministry, for real ministry. For God to use the experiences of your life to be a blessing to other people. Is anybody here wanting to join me this morning? Anybody wanting to join me this morning? Wave those hands to Jesus. If you truly want to join me this morning, wave those hands to Jesus. Wave those hands to Jesus. Come on, wave it. As you wave it, grace is coming upon you. Grace is coming upon you. Grace is coming upon you. God will use the worst experiences of your life to be a blessing to somebody. God will use those experiences to be a blessing to somebody. He will use those experiences to be a blessing to somebody. I've had awful experiences in my life. I, I've told the story of how I grew up many times. Grew up from food of commotion. Yeah. Six mothers in the house. You no, know, four mothers in the house. Dad was never really around. But today, people look at me and they say, oh, you have good people skills. How, how won't I have it? Grew up with 25 children. <laughs> and I was at the rung of the ladder. So if, if I didn't respect myself, they would, they would pull me on me. So I had to respect myself. And I learned from that. A lot from that. It was painful. I was beaten. I was, <laughs> I was struck down but not destroyed. <laughs> Persecuted, but not abandoned. I have marks to show for it. No, true. So if you have issues with people, I can help. Because I've had myriads of issues with people from growing up, from age three and four. I've known what it means to struggle for your right. 
and yet be denied if you are not sharp enough. But those are the things that God wants to use. So that today, when I stand in front of people, when I talk to people, I can have an understanding of where they are coming from. From certain, I mean, in certain regards. And God wants to turn my pain into pleasure. He wants to turn, he wants to turn what, what I've gone through to something with which it can bless somebody. And it's the same for you. It's the same for you. You may not be a pastor, but your ministry can emanate from your experiences. Is somebody still with me this morning? I said, are you still with me this morning? This morning, I want to pray. I want to pray for someone who is going through something. And it seems as if that thing is tearing you apart. I want to trust God to take you through it. I want to trust God that this failure will be failing forward. Even if you have made a mistake. Accept you're wrong, but keep moving. That's why I'm here this morning. Keep moving. Keep moving. Because God, when he has taken you out, wants to turn that experience into a ministry. Into a ministry. I don't know what it is, but I just feel led this morning to pray with such people in this congregation. I feel led this morning to pray with such people. And as I pray, I believe God is turning those experiences into miracles. But much more than that, when you are out, just like Jesus told Peter, says, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. When you are out, strengthen your brethren. Do ministry. Do ministry. Also, if you would like to start up any kind of ministry, any kind of group, brother, can you stand? Stand. 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 The moment the service is over, Please see Brother Debo. If you can't get a hold of him, go to TJ, Pastor T, any of them. My wife, any of the people in front. Please see them. And just, just drop your details. And just give an idea of what you would like to do. We will help you to, to brand it. If you don't have a name for it, we will name it. We are gifted in that area. I want you to stand, please. Stand. 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 Father, we bless you. Wave your hands to him and bless him this morning. The presence of God is here. The presence of God is here. Wave your hands to him and bless him. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your presence in this place. Down at your feet, O Lord, is the most high place. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I see. Can I have that song projected, please? Multimedia. Down at your feet, down, down at your feet, oh Lord, it is the most high place. In your presence, Lord, I seek your face, I see your face. There's no higher calling. There is no higher calling, no greater harm than to bow and kneel before your throne. I'm amazed, oh God, I'm amazed at your glory and by your mind. Lord, we declare this morning that down at your feet is the most high place. Because there's no higher calling, no greater honor that we can, than for us to drop all our experiences at your feet. 
drop our gifts, our abilities, our personalities at your feet and allow you to use them for ministry. And we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. We thank you this morning.